Today, I'm talking about my uh, diagnosis of ADHD, how I was diagnosed at the age of 47, late in life, and what I have learned in the last six years of digging into this topic, researching it, and learning as much as I can, not only to help myself and our two daughters who also have ADHD, but so that I could share this information because I want as many people to understand this as possible. So these are the six lesser known signs of adult ADHD. Number one is hyperfocus, And this was a surprise to me because I remember seeing this in our son. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, this kid does not have ADHD. He just hates homework. I mean, he can sit and laser focus in on his video games. So clearly he can laser focus in on homework. That's not true. A surprising sign of ADHD is the ability to hyper, hyper, hyper focus in certain settings but not be able to pay attention at all in other settings. And this has to do with what's going on in your brain and your prefrontal cortex in particular when you have ADHD, which we will get to in a moment. But hyper-focus is present for me. I can hyper-focus and get lost in my work. I can hyper-focus when I have to give a speech. Like I literally have like those blinders on that horses wear, the big Clydesdales. I have tunnel vision when I have to do something like that. It's like the rest of the world does not exist. Now, when I'm done doing something like that, I have a complete collapse. I'm exhausted. My brain, the gas tank is empty, but I can hyperfocus, which would make you think, well, then you don't have ADHD. Well, here's the rub on it. ADHD is not the inability to focus. That's not what it is. ADHD is a disorder in your brain that impacts your prefrontal cortex and the two jobs that the prefrontal cortex must do around attention itself. And we will get into this because attention is both being able to tune out or suppress external and internal noise. And it is also the ability to ramp up parts of your brain so that you can focus on something effectively. And so it's way more than just paying attention to something. It requires a bunch of switching in your brain in terms of which network your brain is using. And we're going to dig into that. Don't worry. Second sign that is a lesser known sign of adult ADHD, difficulty controlling your emotions. I'll say that again, difficulty controlling your emotions. See... What happens is that you, when you struggle with ADHD, you're using up so much mental energy trying to pay attention that there's no gas in the tank to be able to tolerate the emotions of being frustrated or tired. It's why I would snap at my kids all the time. It's why I would get this tone of voice when I'm frustrated with something and I just can't deal anymore. It's why I would get really emotional with myself and erupt at myself. Why the fuck did you forget her birthday again? What is wrong with you? She's your best fucking friend. Why haven't you bought Christmas presents yet? Why do you leave everything to the last minute? You missed that deadline again? So being eruptive at myself as well. The third really surprising sign of adult ADHD, and boy do I have this one in spades, impulsive shopping and overspending. It's like you're blind to it. And you get this huge rush for buying something. And then all of a sudden you realize that was stupid and you didn't need it. And this has to do with what Dr. Amen, who's one of the world's leading experts on the brain, says is your attempt to stimulate your brain with a dopamine rush. So shopping isn't the only addictive behavior. A lot of adults that have ADHD and it's not properly being managed have a problem with drinking, drugs, other addictions, impulsive behaviors, all tied to the structural issue with the prefrontal cortex. The fourth surprising uh, sign is time blindness. Time blindness. You're terrible with time management. I am terrible with time management. I'm constantly late. I keep myself on track with reminders on my phone. I am the last person to get in the car for our family. I am always a minute late to the call. As hard as I try to be on time, it feels impossible to me. Another surprising sign is that many people with ADHD are actually very high functioning. 
on the outside, you look like a workaholic. You look very successful. Or if you're not working, you're just one of those people that's super duper 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 busy. But here's the thing. Your busyness and your workaholism is scattered all over the place. And that desire to keep your mind busy is also due to the fact that you have problems in your prefrontal cortex suppressing the noise that is going on outside and also the noise going on with your critical voice. And finally, this leads me to the big one. Adults with ADHD tend to be highly, highly, highly self-critical. You assume you're always screwing up. You constantly beat yourself up for not being able to do simple things. You're worried that you're disappointing everybody. You're wondering why it looks effortless for everybody else but you. And this is the default mode of what your own inner dialogue sounds like. Ding, 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 ding. Mel Robbins, I got all six. I spent decades of my life beating myself up. Let me, let, me, let me just explain some of the ways this played out in my life because I think this will give you an insight into what you may be dealing with if this is in fact you. So in relationships, I was plagued, plagued for 50 years with feeling like I'm not a good enough friend. I'm not a good enough girlfriend. I'm not a good enough sister. I'm not a good enough mom or wife that I should, I should have sent more care packages. Why can't I remember birthdays? Why am I always missing the sign up date for school conferences for this, for that? Why am I always arriving late for pickup? You know, if I were better at this or a better person, like this plagued me. It plagued me. And here's the thing. Now that I'm diagnosed with it, I still do this shit. If I don't put the systems in place, and what did that mean for me? Well, when it comes to birthdays, here's what it meant. I care about birthdays. I feel like an asshole when I miss somebody's birthday. And so I spent an entire day cross-checking Facebook, which is where most people's birthdays are, and putting them on repeat in my Google Calendar. And then I worked, that worked sort of, but I realized when the thing goes off on the day of somebody's birthday, it just makes me remember to call them or text them. But there are people in my life I'd like to send a present to. So by failing again for a year, I realized I need to go a step further and put a week before notification that goes off. So I have time to actually get a present or a card in the mail. And so you start to set up systems because you realize this is just not the way your brain works. It's just not wired to remember this shit. And that's okay. That's okay. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I just thought I was a shitty friend. I just thought everybody else figured this out but me. Another thing, work. When I look back at my work history, holy moly. I am a horrendous employee unless I am in an environment where I can move all over the place. I cannot work in an office. Why? Well, because I can't shh. I can't shh the horns over there. I have this like problem where if my kids are two rooms away from me and they're listening to TikTok videos... It's as if they're blaring them in my ears. I can't suppress that noise around me. And so any job that I had in an office, I wanted to die because I could hear everybody at all times. I could hear the door. I could hear the elevator ding. I did not know that this was ADHD. I just thought I had like super ears or something. Like I, I thought everybody heard like this. And so when I think about the jobs where I was really successful, I was moving around. Waitressing, loved waitressing. Bartending, oh, I loved bartending. Uh, working at Legal Aid when I was a, a criminal defense attorney for Legal Aid in 1994 as a young lawyer. I love that job because I would start the day in my office. I'd walk across the street to the court at 100 Canal Street. I'd be in court bopping around all day. I'd be out to Rikers. I'd be back to the office. It was always changing. That was beautiful for my brain. What I do now, beautiful for my brain. No day is the same. I excel in what we do now because I am working in a place that works for this kind of brain. School, I've already explained to you. Disaster, absolute disaster. Yeah, 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 I know, I got into Dartmouth. So I scored really well on the SATs and I came from a tiny town in Michigan. And not a lot of kids applied there. In fact, nobody had ever applied there. But I was the queen of all-nighters, the queen of procrastination. 
I can look back now and realize why I almost failed this big engineering class at Dartmouth. It's because there were 400 kids in the class. I couldn't pay attention. I couldn't organize myself. I was time blind. I, I, I missed out on so much because I was so busy thinking that I was a failure. And why couldn't I get this? And why couldn't I organize? And why couldn't I read on time? I don't even know how I got through law school. Um, daily life, clutter everywhere. Literally, papers everywhere. Kleenexes, blow my nose, put them on a counter. Um, overspending. Does this sound familiar? You kind of overspend to compensate for other things. You feel bad about yourself, so you buy a new outfit, or you forgot to take something to the dry cleaner, and now you don't have a dress to wear, so you got to quickly order a dress, but then you don't like the dress. This is my life. And then the credit card bill comes, and you didn't think that far. This was my life. I should be the poster child for the container store because until we did the episode that we recently did about decluttering versus organizing, I just thought if I just bought more baskets and I made everything look pretty, then I would be organized. But the truth is I just have too much clutter because my mind doesn't organize. And so you have to declutter before you can organize. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But I think the biggest thing for me and why I wanted to talk to you about this is because of the heightened impact of the negative self-talk. See, that's the thing that I was never able to suppress shh, until recently. The critical, relentless voice that I constantly had harping in my ear, constantly criticizing what I wasn't doing. I had no clue this was related to ADHD. And the most important aspect of dealing with ADHD for myself is not to make myself wrong for it and not to hate the ADHD. Think about it this way. If you got diagnosed with diabetes, does it help you to hate diabetes? No. You basically say, oh, thank God I know because now I can help myself. Now I can do things to regulate insulin. Now I can do things to make sure that I am happy and healthy and I have a long, successful life. And that's the way that I feel about ADHD. If you understand it and you know what it is, you can empower yourself to live with it, to have all the great things about it, to laugh at yourself when the stuff happens that always happens with me, and to really take proactive steps to embrace it and to cope in a positive way. There are so many interventions and modalities that help whether you're going to explore medications, which I've done, which have been life-changing. I mean, when I got diagnosed with ADHD and I dug into it and started researching it, I immediately started tapering off anxiety medication because I'm like, this explains everything. And I went on long-acting Adderall. It changed my freaking life because all of a sudden I could go, shh. All of a sudden, I could direct my attention where I needed it to go. And I don't need it in every environment. Like, I don't take it on the weekends because I don't really care if the orchestra's playing. And in certain environments, like whenever I have to give a keynote address and I'm standing backstage, I would never, ever take Adderall on that day. And here's why. The adrenaline that I feel, it's the neuroadrenaline. That's another way you can say that word. I can't say neuroepinephrine or whatever. The adrenaline that hits your brain, your prefrontal cortex, the go, go, go of that it makes the conductor work. I literally have blinders on. And so the adrenaline in that situation makes the switching of the conductor in my brain, shh, everything around me. I don't even hear the event happening. I literally am so focused on what I'm about to go do that the environment provides the chemical release that stimulates my brain to do what I need it to do. So stimulants have been wildly effective for me and effective for one of our kids, not all of our kids. And, you know, it begs the question, why is it that a stimulant is effective for somebody that has something in their brain that makes them fidgety or makes them distracted? Well, it has to do with the blood flow and the neurotransmitters in your brain, which I'm not going to explain to you right now. We'll bring on a full expert like Dr. Ned Hollowell, who is the world's leading expert on ADHD. He's the GOAT. He wrote Driven to Distraction. We can bring on uh, Dr. Amen, who has scanned all the brains and can tell you why so many people with ADHD seek a dopamine dump 
rush from overspending or drinking or some of the other uh, kind of not so great behaviors. But we'll have an expert explain that. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is that it's important if you think that this is something going on with either a son or a daughter, that you get this looked at by a professional. Because studies after study in the last five years have said and concluded that children with ADHD in particular have far, far, far better outcomes later in life if they are treated for ADHD when they're kids. And they think that this is due to the fact that the stimulants and the dopamine and the neuro or the, uh, the, the, ephro, the, 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 I can't say the damn word, like neuro, no, ephro, nephro, nephro, ephro adrenaline or whatever the hell it's called. I, I can't even say it. Um, that the adrenaline and the dopamine accelerates neuroplasticity. And so there's some theories out there that not only does it have better mental health outcomes, particularly for girls, because when you treat this properly, whether you're doing it, you know, I think behavioral therapy, combination of medication, if that's the right thing, which can be tricky, or other more natural supplements, if that's what you care about. Caffeine is something that a lot of parents give their kids instead of some of the other stimulants. That's a deeply personal choice. But I think it's important to know that kids not treated with drugs and behavioral therapy when they have ADHD have a higher tendency toward addiction and not great outcomes versus the kids with ADHD who are treated with drugs and with natural stimulants and behavioral therapy. And this is research in the last five years. I think it's important to say that. I'm not telling you what to do. But in order to save your daughter from the profoundly negative impacts of ADHD on psychology and on anxiety and depression and eating disorders, there's a tremendous number of kind of coexisting diagnoses when ADHD is present. This is something I want you to take seriously and dig into and learn about and get educated about. And the best place to start is your pediatrician. If you're an adult going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is me, this is me, this is my sister, this is my daughter, this is my boss, this is my colleague, this is my friend, great, send them this episode. Attached to this episode, like all episodes, is a plethora of resources. And one of the resources that we are going to link to is a self-assessment. This is not how you get diagnosed with ADHD, but this is how you can learn more about ADHD um, and sort of the surprising symptoms and impacts so that you are more empowered to go seek something. And I would start with your general practitioner. I want to tell you a deeply personal story. This is something that happened to me six years ago, and it changed the trajectory of my life. This is a very serious issue, particularly for women, because we are profoundly underdiagnosed. 